Great, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. This is uh, one of the Chamber's signature events and we really enjoy hosting it. And I really want to thank Amita Health and Election Brothers Women and Children Hospital for, for this luncheon and just preparing this, this wonderful room. They, they do a great job every, every year. We really appreciate it. And we'd also like to sp uh, thank our event sponsors, Tate and Lyle and at and yeah. Events like this, yeah, thank you. <laughs> we really couldn't put on an event like this without our great sponsors, so we really appreciate all, all your support. Another, another great uh, part of this job that I have is that uh, many times I'm a, I get to introduce the mayors. So I, I'd like to welcome Mayor Bill McLeod, if you'd come up and take over his master of ceremonies. Thank you, Chad. Um, we're very pleased to have so many people here. I remember we do this back in the day, there'd be 30 or 40 people for the legislative uh, luncheon. We're very pleased that we have uh, Representative Morrison and Representative Musman and Senator Murphy and Representative Fred Crespo. I particularly appreciate each and every one of them coming here, but I've been in this position where you're facing an inquisition to some extent, so. Thank you all for coming. Okay, you want to you want to start with the opening statement, Tom? Uh, Representative Tom Morrison. So since I'm the one Republican on the table, do I get three times as much time? <laughs> I don't think so. All right. <laughs> Doesn't hurt to ask. I'm Tom Morrison. I represent the 54th House District, not to be confused with School District 54, which is very close. Uh, my district goes from downtown Barrington through Inverness, uh, North Hoffman Estates, most of Palatine, most of uh, Inverness, Rolling Meadows, and uh, the western part of Farmington Heights. So it's almost a square-shaped district. Very unusual, very unusual in the state of Illinois. I am in my fourth term, and uh, I'm the Republican spokesman of the House Personnel and Pensions Committee, as well as a few other committees like uh, Health and Life Insurance, Environment Committee, uh, those are the three that, that meet most often. The others don't meet as, as much. And I have uh, tried to push pension reform as best as possible. I've been to many of these meetings where I talk about it every single year uh, because it's an ongoing problem for the state of Illinois. And it's not just Illinois that's facing massive pension liabilities. Just uh, most other states, even uh, the ones where you, you, know, you would think that uh, their states are running you know, more functionally than Illinois, they have pension problems too because there's a common thread. It's easy to make promises, politicians love to make promises that don't have to be kept for decades into the future. And uh, so anyway, it's a common problem. I'm trying to fix it by moving our state to a 401k style plan on a go forward basis. As many of you know, that's what's had to happen in the private sector for businesses to, st to remain open. And with government, government wouldn't close or shut down, but it's very difficult for us to fund our, our priorities on an ongoing basis with so much of our state's resources and even our local resources just going to finance our pension systems. And so I think it's fair for the employees themselves. Um, they need certainty. They need uh, um, a solution to this, but also the taxpayers need it. Both residential and commercial property tax need, payers need the certainty so that we can move forward as a state. And yes, we do need certainty, but it shouldn't come in the form of a massive tax hike because Illinois is already overtaxed if you look at the income tax combined with the property tax. So those are some of the issues that I've been fighting for down in Springfield, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Representative. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Representative Michelle Mussman. I represent the 56th District, which is large portions of Schaumburg, Hoffman Estates, and Elk Grove, and smaller pieces of Palatine, Rolling Meadows, Hanover Park, and uh, Roselle. So I am part of Tom's incoming freshman class, so I'm just finishing my fourth term also. Uh, my larger committees are Appropriations Human Services, Appropriations Elementary Education, Education Curriculum and Policy. I'm also the chair of the Special Needs Committee this year. Um, and as he said, many committees meet more often than others, so it is quite the list. Um, I was proud to also serve on the Public Safety Task Force this year, which as you know is a big concern really across the nation as we discuss um, gun safety measures and how to improve school safety across the state. Um, I would say since uh, Tom had introduced the, the door a little bit with the pension conversation, I would remind you that the state did attempt to change the Tier 1 COLA, and we were told by the Supreme Court that that was not an option. 
The tier two system, in which is all of the new hires, actually pays more into the pension system than they will stand to get back in benefit, and we do want to be cautious about that with the federal government. Uh, we also introduced the door to a tier three, which is a 401k style option, and as part of this year's budget process, we also introduced two optional buyout programs for people who no longer want to be in our pension system. So we are making the changes that are available to us. We're constantly exploring new opportunities for reducing our pension obligation, but some of the largest opportunities for cost reduction have been taken off the table by the court system. So we still have quite a bit of work to do. Uh, we are pleased to have a budget on time this year through honest bipartisan cooperation. So we're all very excited about that. Um, Obviously, property taxes are the biggest concern many of us are hearing about door to door. I remember within the last year or so, the homeowner's exemption got bigger, the seniors' exemption got bigger, the veterans' exemption got bigger, and seniors can now start accessing their freeze at $65,000. So there's a big things the state did to try and influence the rate of the property taxes. And also, I will remind you of the landmark education reform. And that's, again, one of the biggest things the state can do to influence the cost of property taxes because that is the largest portion of the bill. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Thank you so much. I'm Laura Murphy, state senator in the 28th district. And the 28th district encompasses Michelle Mossman's communities, so I won't repeat those, and the city of Chicago. Mount Prospect, a little Arlington Heights, Elk Grove, Marty Moreland is my other representative. Um, so it's those two communities that um, I have the pleasure of representing. I am, in my first term uh, as an elected official, I was appointed to complete uh, Dan Katowski's term um, for you know just a couple months, and now so I am past the freshman legislator cycle. I'm really excited to be able to serve on um, a number of committees, one, most importantly the Higher Ed Committee. I also serve on gaming, public health, appropriations, which is our budget com um, committees, and a state government committee. I, I can't echo enough everything that Michelle just said. That is absolute fact that those are the things that we've done, so I won't reiterate all that. Um, but tell you that I am really excited for the future of Illinois because what our communities that we represent in border, because all the northwest suburbs tend to have the same economic um, status and growth. We all kind of see our communities are usually you can step across the street and be in a different community. So we tend to see that. I have unprecedented <coughs> occupancy in Elk Grove Village right now, where their industrial park and their business community, unprecedented occupancy. I think last year when I was here, I shared with you that there are six, there were 68 cranes up in the city of Chicago, and every time you see a crane, that means significant growth, jobs, uh, and financial stability. Do we need to work on our property taxes? Absolutely, because we do have some of the highest property taxes in the area. But we do have to remember that our communities demand quality education for our students. That's what drives your property values. That's what determines what our homes are worth, our largest investment. So we have to have a balance there. The biggest step for the state to step up and now pay 46% of the cost of education with our new school funding formula, which is an evidence-based objective formula that we are implementing. You haven't seen any effects of that yet because it just started to take effect in July. So you're not going to reap any benefits yet. Um, so I don't want anybody to have unrealistic expectations that tomorrow you're going to see some changes. It just simply doesn't work that fast. Um, and I, I think that the growth of the state as we're seeing more and more prosperity is exciting and that we will continue on that vein. But we have to continue to sell Illinois. There is nothing wrong with the state of Illinois that we cannot fix. We have answers, we have solutions, we just have to make sure that those are implemented. So I look forward to your discussions today, and I want you to know I am not up for election, so feel free to ask me any questions. Well, then we have four year terms in the Senate, so thank you so much. Thank you. Representative Crespo. I do have a real <laughs> 
Well, first of all, welcome to my district. So this really is my district, and, and I represent all the parts of Schaumburg, all three states, Streamwood, Denver Park, a little bit of Ocean and Bartlett. Uh, my claim to fame is that uh, I'm a former trustee here in all three states. And, uh, I blame my political career to uh, the man all the way in the left, uh, the mayor of Paul for the States. Uh, many years ago, he encouraged me to run for trustee because he wanted some diversity on the board. Uh, and I'm not sure why not. Uh, I ran, I won. Shortly after that, I was recruited to run for this seat. Did not know what I was getting into. Uh, I lost like 20 pounds that first year, running against a 22 year incumbent. Uh, this is my sixth term, I ran for my seventh. And I also realized the other day that uh, with the retirement of State Representative David Harris from Arlington Heights, I'm actually the most veteran legislator in the Northwest suburbs. Wow. And the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> in, in Springfield, I share several committees. I share the Appropriations Committee for General Services, and I'm also chairman of the Education Committee for Curriculum and Policy. Um, the main reason I ran for this office 12 years ago was because of education. Uh, when you look at the district, we have the second largest school unit, K-12, in the state, and that's U46. We have the largest high school district, 211, and the largest elementary secondary uh, district, 54. So where it has to see, I always needs to be engaged, needs to be involved in education. Uh, so I'm proud to say I've been chairing out of the education committee for five years. I was intimately involved with the process of the education funding reform, uh, and I was also uh, uh, introduced legislation, and I worked with the State Board of Education and all the stakeholders to implement every student succeeds act, which replaces no, no shall left behind. Um, I'm happy that uh, we have some great school districts out here, and when we talk about property taxes, it's the main the biggest issue in this case: property taxes. Uh, when you look at your tax bill, it goes to 60 70% of your tax bill goes to education. And we cannot talk about property tax relief until we talk about education funding. It's very simple. And according to a commission that the government put together, we are underfunding education today anywhere from 7 to $10 billion. In this nation, we rank first or second in the reliance of property taxes to fund education. So until we address education funding, with education, we have a very, very difficult time uh, to incur property taxes. Uh, you know, I'm happy to work with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm proud to live in Boston States. We have a great mayor. We have some great institutions like St. Alexis or And I want to acknowledge uh, our good friend, Kelly Clancy. Where's Kelly? Uh, Kelly Clancy works here at the hospital. We've been friends for a long time. And uh, we've done some great things working together. Uh, we actually work together to secure more funding for this hospital, you know, to one to two million dollars more, a year, three million dollars more a year. Um, the legislation was able to pass, uh, thanks to her, they just, she said, a pit bull, she let go. She just kept pushing me to be able to pass this legislation. I'm working with the Village of Hawking Estates, and as well as the hospital, we were able to secure funding for the full Barrington Energy. That was a pipe dream years ago. And just the fact that we were able to get together, the hospital donated a million dollars towards that effort too. The mayor and the trustees, the village manager were, were absolutely, absolutely great. We had meetings with the tollway, with IDOT. We were taking our dog and pony show all over the place to make sure we got the attention. The $68 million project, the fact that we had all hands on deck, we worked together, we were able to get it done. And that not only helps help the states, but it helps the entire region as well. Uh, we've done some other good things, and some people might say we're not that great, but you know, we were able to keep the Sears headquarters here in Hoffman and Spence. Uh, and that was a big, big heavy lift, and again, thanks to the Mayor McLeod of the Village, we were able to get that done. So I look forward to continue working with the Village, with all of you to uh, throw the wall for the community. I think uh, all, all of you were elected, I think that you put a person aside and just do a strike for, for the community, we're going to be fine. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Murphy, what is your biggest accomplishment from the last two legislative sessions? You know, I, I'll just deal specifically with what I did because, you know, it's a, uh, the big legislation you're all aware of and what, what's occurred. And that, of course, being a budget done on time so that we didn't have to suffer 736 days without a budget. And you all know what that did to some of your agencies and to um, higher education, social services, all kinds of things. But what I'm particularly proud of is this um, 
last uh, legislative session was I was able to get a bill passed that um, uh, the, uh, it's HB 2617. I always have to write the numbers down because they get confusing. But that allows for, um, it mandates that insurance companies have to pay for uh, preservation of fertility organs. Um, so when young people are diagnosed with cancer, imagine you have, you know, an adolescent, young adult that are diagnosed with cancer. They have to undergo treatment rather quickly. And now insurance is going to have to pay the preservation of their fertility organs so that if they decide to have children in the future, that they will be able to have un chemo affected um, uh, fertility use so that I think that's extremely important. And if any of you have had children that have had to go through cancer treatment, you know how important that is. I also am, uh, and I'm just talking about bills that went through both chambers, mostly in a bipartisan fashion, were signed by the governor. And another one is that uh, dealing with property tax relief. And so previously, veterans had to wait until the next uh, tax cycle to apply for their veterans exemption status. Veterans are eligible to have, um, disabled veterans are eligible to have a tax credit. And so now you're able to prorate that. So when you move into your home, the assessor's office will prorate that to the first day of the month that you move into your home and you won't have to wait for a uh, future and lose all that money and wait for a return on that. So those are two really big bills that I'm proud of that were able to go to um, law. They weren't just bills that were introduced. I also was able to focus this cycle on a number of constituent concerns so that, I know, it's Murphy's Law. <laughs> so a number of constituent concerns, because that's what I think we're there for. When constituents bring you a problem, that we're able to get a resolution and solve those issues. And, and one of those is in a bordering community here that um, had an issue with her dog. And we've created a new um, reckless dog owner category, helps local police uh, because it gives them some additional enforcement tools helps give some closure to the lady whose dog was killed by her neighbor's dog, and makes people to be more responsible. So um, I, I'm going to continue on some bills that were introduced that did not have time. They're perhaps a little more controversial, and they take a little bit more time to go through the process. Um, and that has to do with changing the rate that we pay for um, interest on our late bills. And uh, I'm particularly uh, concerned about a workman's comp bill that will um, mandate that when you have repetitive long-term injuries, which some of you have employees, that you've encountered that, and that employee comes to you and within eight months they have that injury, and you know that that has occurred in their past jobs, so that will um, kind of make everybody pay their fair share into that. Thank you. Representative Mustard, what is your, you think is your biggest accomplishment? So one of the bills actually that I was very proud to work on this year um, has to do with improving the flexibility of school districts to utilize their funding to assist homeless students and families. So according to federal law, McKinney Bento, if your family becomes homeless, the school district has to allow you to attend the school in their district regardless of where you actually end up being housed, whether you're living with family and friends who are many cities away or whether or not you're in a homeless institution or, or a at the advocacy place at that moment in time, and it can be incredibly expensive for them to send buses and cabs to pick you up, and it's an incredible disruption with the child and their education. So if it's actually less expensive for them to use those funds to help you remain housed within the district, it gives them the flexibility to do that. So it's going to save all of us a lot of money and actually improve the trajectory of the outcome for not only that student but their entire family. And again, now the student will have less disruption to their lives and they'll be able to more consistently focus on their studies, which will give them a better a better situation as they move forward. And, and honestly, that was, that was work that was created right here in our own district by the homeless advocacy organizations as, as we met with them and tried to brainstorm what what could actually help right so again most of the best legislative ideas come right from our own constituents right from the work that we're doing here in the community and so I cannot encourage you enough as you as you experience problems you know in your in your day-to-day -day lives or your jobs you know let us know how those are influencing you and how maybe we can help out, we can help out with that but I I really think that's a great win for, for money and for kids. You can't go wrong there.
Thank you. Representative Morrison, your biggest accomplishment? Um, when you're someone like me in the minority uh, in the legislature, sometimes your biggest accomplishments just have to be uh, redefined a little bit and not necessarily passing big bills or even small bills, but just bringing certain arguments that need to be brought up on the House floor during debate on, on things like pensions, on things like property taxes, on things like the budget. And so that's, that's how I view my role um, on, on things like the budget. You know, there's, there are there's a lot of individuals in both parties, frankly, who will, will tout the bipartisan nature of this last budget. And, and clearly it's better to have a, a budget um, than no budget. But what passed this past summer was more like a spending plan rather than a balanced budget per what our Constitution requires. Uh, because when the state of Illinois just uh, a few weeks ago uh, sent out an application, you know, to borrow more money, it admitted that the, that this last budget was a, at least a billion dollars out of balance. And there are schemes that occur every year. I mean, for example, the sale of the Thompson Center. We only have one Thompson Center to sell. But if you count revenues for the sale of the Thompson Center in multiple years, that's not an honest budget. Um, the, the pension buyout that Representative Musman mentioned have very, very rosy projections about the actual savings there. Uh, the 401k component, not a single person has had the opportunity to opt into a 401k plan. Not a single person, because none of the pension plans actually have a system in place to allow it. I mean, they've, they've passed the bill, uh, but that doesn't mean anybody has, has had an opportunity to do it. So anyway, um, and lastly, it spends all, this last budget spends all of the t income tax increase without touching the unpaid bills. So we still have about $8 billion in unpaid bills out there. And so I try to bring those uh, issues to light uh, so that the public has a better understanding of what's going on. Thank you. Representative Crespo, you may have already answered this, but what's your biggest accomplishment for the last two legislative sessions? Yeah. You hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Well, yeah, I had a look yesterday and uh, I looked at the bills that I worked on the last couple of sessions. Uh, this year alone, uh, the governor signed 12 bills that I worked on, so, so I had to pick and choose which ones. Uh, I only have a minute, so I'll mention a couple of them. We had the uh, Debt Transparency Act, and that's a bill that I worked closely with the controller uh, to make sure that all the agencies will disclose how much they're holding liabilities. It's something they never did, they just hold these vouchers. Uh, we did find out after we passed the bill that, uh, that they had to disclose that we owed close to a billion dollars in late fees because we didn't have a budget and we were hanging on to those bills. Uh, I also passed, I mentioned the uh, Every Student Succeeds implementation of the bill, so we're, we're closely with that, monitor that closely with school districts and see if we have to tweak along the way. Uh, the, uh, when I was working on the uh, funding for education, the first time ever, we're fully funding bilingual education in the state of Illinois at the tune of 28, close to $30 million. So I'm very proud of that as well. Uh, we had a bill that I passed for Stromberg to help the Renaissance Center. I know they're not here. Uh, but we worked closely with the Mayor Larson on that as well. And perhaps one of the biggest things, and, and uh, I give credit to Kelly Clancy, uh, I passed a resolution, Resolution 100, that required the Auditor General to monitor the MCLs, the managed care organization. Phase one of the MCLs was $7.2 billion. $7.2 billion. And we found out through the audit there was no oversight. Uh, to this day, they came before the Audit Commission, I said on the Audit Commission, they couldn't even tell me how much they spent on administrative costs, almost two years later. So we kept that audit open. Uh, it was perhaps one of the worst audits I've ever seen. Uh, we'll keep investigating. I know uh, David Sweeney, or sorry, David Sweeney and I, this is a letter to the Attorney General asking her, we're asking the office to investigate for something that's not right, especially when you consider $7.2 billion is down the drain. Uh, when you look at health care outcomes, they can't show anything. Uh, and now the administration is saying that the purpose of the MCOs was not to save money. This doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. So uh, I had a couple other ones, but I, I think those are perhaps some of the biggest ones that I passed. And I, luckily, most of those that I passed have been with the help of uh, my colleagues on the other side. The Debt Transparency Act that I did pass, the governor vetoed that bill. And I was able to pass it unanimously out of the uh, out of the house, and we overwrote the government. And then a couple last session, I passed the Grant Accountability Transparency Act, 
which is a model for grants in the state of Illinois has been recognized nationally, and we've been able to save close to $500 million just in synergies and efficiencies in terms of grant administration. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Musman, how do you believe the state of Illinois can assist the village of Hawkins Estates in the potential redevelopment of the AT&T property? So I would say you want to have a good partnership with your Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, right, to be talking about what kind of loans or other programs would be available for any of the companies that want to perhaps move in and maybe need some assistance with that. Um, I think it's a great resource that's really been underutilized, uh, not only by the community, but I also think that the, the state with their um, inconsistent funding, shall we say, and maybe varying priorities of the current administration, I, I think it's a department that hasn't really been allowed to flex its muscle and be in, used to its best advantage. So I, I certainly think that that is important. And, and certainly as they're out and about traveling across the country looking for economic opportunity, they can be talking up this amazing site that is available right here in Hoffman Estates and all the other amenities that are going to be available to residents who want to move close to where they were. And just the assets that are available, your proximity to the highways and everything that, that would be an asset to the business community and great things like your chamber, which again, stand ready to assist any businesses that would be moving into the community. So I think that would be a, a good asset. Hey, Senator Murphy, how can the state help ATT property redevelop in Hawkins Estates? Well, who wouldn't want to develop in Hawkins Estates? First right. off, right? Good answer. <laughs> Um, but the, the Department of Economic um, Deco, that department, is the one that is responsible for <coughs> assisting communities. And I don't know what you might want as a village uh, to see in that development, but I would encourage them uh, and whoever your developers to look at that there is low to no interest senior housing money available. And you know we know all of our communities face such a shortage for providing senior housing. So that could be a great um, caveat, the carrot for any developer as well. Because um, technically, you know, if you're looking at some kind of mixed use development, that might be a perfect opportunity. Thank you. Representative Crespo, how can the state help? Well, actually, I've been involved with all the states on this matter. And we actually met with a developer from New Jersey. We, we toured the AT&T site. And it's really something exciting when you look at the plans. It's like, it's like a city within a city. Uh, it's one of a kind. They have another development in New Jersey that we looked at, and it's uh, it's fascinating. As a matter of fact, I did bring DCO to uh, Hoffman Estates to meet with the mayor and staff. Uh, we had several meetings, and uh, based on those meetings, I, I introduced House Bill 5625, which we back in April, which we called it the Big Empty Center. So we're looking at a facility similar to the AT property. See what can the state do to somehow incentivize those developers to come into the state. Uh, I continue working with, with them. I met the, uh, the folks from the uh, from New Jersey. They're very excited as well. And uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. I think it's definitely put off in the states and the Northwest suburbs in the map if we're able to pull this off. But uh, uh, that, that's a great part, too, to the leadership of Mayor McLeod. And I'm looking at Jim Norris and, and, and the trustees that are able to get out there, find these folks, bring them in here. Uh, we had a great dog and pony show when they came to Hoffman the states. They're very excited. And, uh, Let's just, you know, if you pray, keep praying, because we need that change. Mm -hmm. Let's have it. Representative Morrison, how can the state help um, develop that site? Well, I mean, just getting our overall state finances better in line, like I said, without a major tax increase. And, and just the fact that so many of these properties uh, are vacant because of things like property taxes um, and then other business issues like workers' comp insurance costs and, and other related business expenses. Um, the fact that a lot of these places demand or require incentives should tell us something as a state. That if we were attractive, we wouldn't need these incentives. And when one entity does get an incentive, or a group of entities get an incentive, that just means that everybody else has to pay more. And so um, I, I would rather just have a level playing field as best as possible, just make the taxes as low and, and flat and, and uh, as reasonable as possible at every level and we won't have to uh, worry about people coming to us because we're centrally located, we have a diverse economy. All the positives about Illinois are there. Our issues are personnel and policy. Thank you. Representative Crespo, are there any programs or grant opportunities available for small and medium-sized businesses to grow, expand, et cetera, 
Where is that information located? How can people access it? So, so actually, we've talked about the Department of Commerce Economic Opportunity. We do have some some uh, some initiatives in the toolbox, what we call the EDGE and the Angel Investment uh, Incentives as well. Um, and, you know, if you talk to DCEO, and there's another group uh, the, the, uh, that the governor put together, uh, Intersect Illinois, which is a public-private partnership. And if you talk to those folks, this is what they'll tell you. When they're out there trying to recruit businesses that come to the state, there's a couple of things you're looking for. Number one is transportation. Can they move their products? Can they get employees in and out? And when you look at Illinois, we are perhaps better than most other states when it comes to that. Second, they look at education. And when you look at education in Illinois, it's concerned not only our state schools, but our private schools as well. We have some of the best engineering schools in the country. Taxes probably comes in third. And this is what else I'll tell you. When you have a governor in the state of Illinois, bad Molly the state, day in and day out, that definitely does not help. Because you can have a great transportation hub, you can have great education institutions out there. If they hear a governor of the state, and on the state, why would you want to come to the state? I take it personally, because I have I'm probably, I'm probably say I was born in the state, and it really bothers me for anyone to bat off the state until finally, finally he saw the light yesterday. He apologized. After four years, ah, maybe I was wrong. Well, it's a little bit too late now. And it's really a turkey economy of the state of Illinois. And again, that on the state does not help. We have so many assets, so many things to offer. Um, and again, we do have some stuff. Again, okay, answer your question. DC, you just look at their website and you'll see what's out there. It's Senator Murphy. Thank you. I, I couldn't articulate any better than Representative Presbo just said. Um, and so, I would just encourage anyone to apply for those edge credits. But you know, if I could just go back to something Representative Morrison said, you know, in a perfect world, would we have to give incentives? No. But you know in the local communities that if a community next to you offers an incentive, you have to. And when we have the state of Wisconsin that just gave $4 billion in incentives to Foxcom, you know, we have to be competitive. And, and it basically you have your head in the sand if you don't think that we have to remain competitive and compete against, <coughs> states compete against each other's states. And that provides incentive. And people locate into a community and they create jobs and provide taxpayers based upon the incentives you provide. And, and if you don't provide an incentive, corporations do not locate into your community. Representative Westman? Um, so one of the things that I want to point out that I know my small businesses have been asking for for some time was the lowering of the LLC filing fees. And the state didn't lower those dramatically just within the last few years. I would also say, as we tout the DCEO, um, I went there just this morning because I knew this question was there and I wanted to make sure my information was accurate. And right there on the front page, maybe the second page, uh, there's an article called Small Business Financing in Illinois. It was published on June 8th. And it has an entire list. The table of contents is small business loans, small business grants, small business investors, and financing help. So you have Axiom, which is a micro lender, the Village Bank and Trust, Central Illinois Bank, Illinois National Bank, Illinois Sustainable Agriculture and Research Program, Chicago Foundation for Women Grants, the Recycling Expansion and Modernization Program, FedEx Small Business Grant, Women and Minorities in Science and Technology, Small Business Investors in Illinois Fund. You have a lot of things available to you, but you do need to look them up, and you do need to explore them, and we will help in any way possible. Again, if you need assistance talking to your local DCEO representative, I am here for you. Thank you, Representative Morrison. Uh, having run my own small business, my folks ran uh, a small business, a mom and pop a print shop. My grandfather ran a, uh, a one, one or two person advertising firm. Um, what I can tell you is most small business people, they don't want programs and applications and to deal with state government more than they have to. They just want to serve their customers and, and just compete in the marketplace. And so um, when we as a state make things overburdensome and then with the other hand say, but we're here to help you, state government, we're here to help you, um, it just doesn't work. What I hear from, from people in other states is, is it's a lot easier to get licenses approved, it's a lot easier to get permits, and 
then those, those small businesses could just move forward with what they do best, and that's serving their customers, not filling out forms and paperwork and you know applying for different things through their state government. Thank you. Keep the microphone, Representative Morrison. Is the state of Illinois planning any new and different marketing efforts to attract new business and residents to our state? Define the state's retention program and incentives. Um, it's not really my area of expertise, but I, I will say that uh, tourism in Illinois does seem to be um, doing pretty well, and so um, I think there is a, uh, a program for that that is that's you know working working pretty well, but. I think whatever we can do to be a, a greater draw for the convention business, and I know Hoffman Estates has a piece of that, and, and some of the other area communities, Schomburg, they, they want some of that action as well. Um, so I think Illinois does sell itself in a lot of areas. I mean, there is no more beautiful city than the city of Chicago. And just the recreational opportunities, the arts uh, that's available there, the fact that we're centrally located, so if you're a business and industry, um, virtually everyone in your uh, in your industry can get to Chicago on a one-way flight, I'm sorry, on a non-stop flight. Um, we're a hub, we're a transportation hub. And so there's a lot of great things about Illinois. The fact that Lake Michigan is a nice natural barrier means, uh, and that will always be there as, as far as I'm concerned, um, Illinois has a lot going for it. And so, I, again, I think if we just fix some of our, our fiscal uh, imbalances on pensions and taxes and things like that, Illinois' economy is going to take off. Hey, Senator Murphy. Thank you. Um, we, one of the things that we offer in Illinois is film credits. And if you just watch TV now, you know Chicago Med, Chicago, um, the, the fire, the police, they're all on TV. They're all here in Illinois because of the film credits that we offer. And they are contributing billions of dollars to our economy. But one of the things that I think is the most important, and, and you heard it mentioned already, that an educated workforce. So, you know, the past four years, under this administration, 72,000 college students chose to go to schools outside of Illinois at a potential loss of $2 billion. That is criminal, absolutely criminal. So we have to pull those college students back into Illinois. And one of the most exciting things I think that we funded in this next budget in the current budget year was we appropriated $500 million to the University of Illinois who was starting a DPI program which is a private public partnership where every student that goes into the business program at U of I is going to go through this think tank innovative center that we're going to be able to compete with places like Singapore and MIT, and those things are going to make Illinois very competitive. So programs like that, I think, help sell Illinois, help sell our workforce, and provide that educated employee that employers look for. Thank you. Representative Crespo. Yeah, I could probably rehash the answer I gave you last time in terms of attracting new businesses. Um, I know that I did mention Intersect Illinois was a public-private partnership that the governor put together. Uh, and he took a lot of resources from the ECO and they migrated over to Intersect Illinois. The only problem is that there's no transparency. So they're playing that private part really well. Uh, so all he knows is based on uh, informal conversations that we've had. I have not seen anything come out of that group yet, not to say that they're working on something big. Uh, we keep an eye on that. Uh, the ECO has done a fabulous job considering how uh, uh, state, uh, how uh, poorly resourced they are. And, and I agree with uh, Representative Morrison as far as tourism. And, and, uh, the tourism department comes before my appropriations committee for the budget. I've made sure for the last five years that we have fully funded tourism in the state of Illinois. And they have recorded some of the best, best numbers they've had in a long, long time. Uh, I've worked closely with the uh, East Chicago Northwest pass legislation to help the convention center here in Chicago as well. And uh, I'm not sure I mentioned this before, but it does not help when you have a governor bad in the state. Representative <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, so I, I will say that the lack of budget for two years really put a crimp in the advertising from your tourism industry. And I, I do think that we saw that, but they are they are back on track now. I know that they're trying to get everything up and running. Um, I know that Corey Joe um, has what has a link called Travel Tuesdays, and they will send you information about all the great things that are happening all across the state to help you maybe make some weekend plans. 
Uh, there's a lot of it, there's a lot going on right now with the state's bicentennial. So there's more things than ever to see all across our state. Um, I would also say that um, recently I know that they had done a commercial effort called like Mini A, where again you had a tiny little Lincoln that traveled around to all the exciting states and or the exciting sites in Illinois. But one of the problems that I thought we had with that honestly is the commercial didn't play in Illinois. So we are we spend our advertising dollars in other states and other cities, right? How many times have you seen a commercial for Pure Michigan, right? Well, they're not advertising that in Michigan, they're advertising it here. So again, because we're not seeing these commercials, I, I think we're kind of not, not appreciating what there is in our own backyard. And honestly, that is, while I understand that might not be where we want to spend our advertising dollars, I, I do wish we had a better appreciation for what was going on right in our own state. Um, just as Fred had said, we did change legislation in the last year to allow our small and mid-sized convention centers more flexibility with how they spend their tourism dollars. And one of the things they were able to do with that is the quail and pheasant hunters enthusiasts will be in the Renaissance Convention Center in February. And I will tell you the DNR is beyond ecstatic. It is apparently much bigger than any of us realize, and it will be the first time that it's gonna be hosted in Illinois, even though apparently we have one of the most robust communities for quail and pheasant hunting enthusiasts. So, so they're thrilled, and I think things like that will bring a lot of attention to the state, and we need to continue to use our dollars to, to do that. Well, you have the microphone, Representative Musman. What is Illinois doing to upgrade our aging infrastructure across the state, and would you support a capital bill in the next legislative session? So there was capital funding in this year's budget, um, but we all know the state hasn't had a very robust capital plan um, in many years. So I would say whoever comes out of this next election really needs to be thinking about how they would again create an industrious plan for capital development for, for the next five years at minimum, right? Um, and of course, if you're going to do something of that magnitude, it is going to require a funding source. Um, I will get out there ahead of it and say you've probably seen some commercials about the vehicle miles tax, right? So one of the things that we would discuss there is, in theory, you're already paying a vehicle miles tax, and that is meant to, the road funds are meant to, infor, uh, to feed um, infrastructure projects like this. That is the gas tax. But the gas tax is no longer working. Technology is outsmarting us, right? So based on federal regulation, all engines are designed to systematically use less and less and less gasoline. And now you have hybrids and electric vehicles on the road that are not paying that tax in any way. So while you have a system that needs support, the revenue that feeds it is diminishing. We also know the federal government, as they deal with their own financial problems, has been sending less money into the states to deal with their road funds. So this is a national conversation, and that is a conversation that will continue to be had in the state of Illinois, is if that tax no longer works, what will we do instead? So that is a long and ongoing conversation. Uh, Tom, or Senator, Senator John Cullerton had actually introduced legislation for this just a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know how quickly we could come to an agreement there, but just know that as part of the conversation, we are going to have to talk about revenue to make sure that we have the money to do this. The other thing that's on the table, of course, is the progressive income tax. Um, and I'm sure one of my colleagues can, can fill you in on that, but revenue will be an important component to this. Representative Morrison. Um, yes, all that's true. How, how do we pay for it? We all know that uh, we need um, well-functioning infrastructure, whether it's road or rail or what have you, waterways even. Um, if you know, saw the story about Metro, uh, one of the things that I've been trying to bring up down in Springfield is how much money the state and federal government is giving to Amtrak and increasing the speed of train service from Chicago to St. Louis. And I really question the return on investment with that because how many people would actually benefit versus the daily riders on Metro and what a, an outage does or what a disruption in service does for Metro and how many hundreds of thousands of people are affected on a daily basis. So I would just like to, I wanna see our money allocated more um, wisely than, than I currently see it. And the last thing about the Capitol Bill, when I first started paying attention to politics, uh, there was the George Ryan Illinois First and one of the components of that Capitol Bill was a statue to Jack Benny. Okay, now I love old time radio, but give me a break. That that is not a uh, that's not a priority. So you I'd like to see Jack what's ben. in a. Huh? You can't pick on Jack. Well, I, I, yeah. can't pick on Jack. anyway, um, what's what's going to be in the capital bill? Is it really uh, a priority, or is it just um, pork for somebody's district? Okay. Okay, uh, State Senator Murphy, you're the only State Senator we got here, so. Thank you. I, I do think we we have to maintain our roads, bridges 
all of our transportation needs. We are the hub of transportation, trains, planes, everything. We're going to see a um, $8 billion enhancement to O'Hare Airport, uh, which is going to then provide additional economic growth. We're going to have to make sure that our roads and rails stay up to par. So I think twofold, we're going to have to do a capital bill. We're going to have to get more money from the federal government in order to, for Illinois to finally get its fair share from the feds. We give so much more money into the feds than what we are able to receive back. So we're going to have to put a lot of pressure on our congressional delegates to bring more money back into Illinois for roads and bridges. Thank you. Representative Well, let me start out by saying that one third of the stage roads are in poor condition. One tenth of those bridges are structurally deficient. Aside from that, we have contaminated water in schools and veteran homes. So the need is there for, for capital project. There's, there's no doubt. The problem is, and we've heard this from my three colleagues here, is how do you pay for it? Do you issue bonds? Do you keep relying on the motor fuel tax, which uh, Representative uh, Mussman talked about? And that's key. And we talked to think tanks throughout the state, and I travel throughout the state that has. Uh, Part of my responsibility as appropriation chair, we look at this like how do you raise money and revenue to take care of roads and bridges? And if you talk to anyone out there, they recognize that well, if you rely on the motor fuel tax, for example, that's not going to work anymore. We're barely making enough just to maintain the roads and bridges that we have today. As cars become more efficient, we see more hybrids, more electric cars. Well, guess what? That revenue continues declining, and the needs for road improvements and bridges continue to go up, and you see this gap. And the question is, well, okay, what do you do? Well, we can raise the motor fuel tax, like this, that's an option, but I don't think that's going to go very well. And then there's a discussion about, well, you know, look at technology, and Michelle mentioned this. You know, technology, most cars, I think as of 2012, are GPS capable. We can monitor cars today. If you park your car, it's amazing. You go somewhere, you see on your phone, and somehow your phone detected where your car is parked. I see it, and I never programmed that on my phone. So cars have that capability. So we talk to think things. They'll tell you, well, you know, that's an option. Maybe we should, instead of building a uh, tax on gas, let's build on usage. We can keep track of where people drive, how much they drive. The technology is there. It's never going to happen. You have privacy issues. So that's a, that's a big issue. Well, then they, some have talked about, well, maybe when you uh, fill out your income tax returns, you put down how many miles you drove that year. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, it's an option. I mean, but okay, now you're going to rely on self-reporting. Yeah. So, so but, but the question is, what do you do? And here, here lies the problem. And I'm not defending David Christopher. You can vote wherever you want. But I think you made a comment about that and you mentioned, you know what, there's some discussions going out there that maybe we should look at what you call the mileage tax. Well, that didn't work out very well for him. <laughs> so we're cautious. So we need to have a conversation, but somehow it becomes very political and people just hold back. But we, it, it's a problem. We need to find a solution. What's the solution? I don't know. Uh, but we need to find a solution fast. And if you talk to uh, those managers, they, they, they recognize this as well. That they see that the funding for motor fuel tax has been decreasing, the needs are greater. There's a gap. And what do you do? Uh, we need to find a solution, and, and, uh, but there's no doubt that we do need a capital, uh, uh, some capital dollars. The other issue is, do you trust whoever's governor to prioritize these dollars the right way? And that's always going to be a challenge in this political atmosphere that we live in today. Earmark solves the entire problems. Earmarks. <laughs> what ideas do you have for revenue enhancements for our state budget? Senator Murphy, since you're not running this year, you can answer first. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure all of you have heard um, a proposition to legalize marijuana and the amount of revenue that that will bring to the state. And uh, I know there's a number of legislators that are going around um, having town hall meetings doing that. I'll put in a plug. Mine is November um, 17th. Uh, so that will be if anybody wants to come and hear the information on that. But also, I, I you know, as Vice Chair of Gaming, I tend to think that we are going to address Sportsbook during the veto session before the Super Bowl. The Supreme Court has determined that sports books are legal 
and every other surrounding state is forming their own laws and charging access or integrity fees for the right to operate in their state. Pennsylvania right now already has $120 million from their just access fees. So I would, you know, I think that you're going to see a discussion about that occur. And that, of course, brings in significant revenue. And most importantly, I think that we need to address our pension problem. And the Center for Tax and Accountability has a wonderful program on their website that shows you how we can incrementally get to funding our pensions without raising taxes. And that, of course, will solve a lot of our financial issues. Thank you. Representative Crespo. Remember, what was the question? Uh, what do you think? Yes, we have. Revenue enhancements for our state. Do you have any ideas for revenue enhancements well, for our state? I think, you know, the first thing we need to do is understand how we generate revenue today. You know, and I know uh, we hear all the time taxes are extremely high in Illinois, and that's a correct statement. They are high. On the aggregate, we add all our taxes, sales tax, income tax, county tax, property tax. We probably rank first or second in the country. It is a huge problem. But, but now, let's look at this in silos. And it's hard because people will tell me, well, Fred, you can look at this in silos if you want, but, but those dollars are coming out of the same pocket. I understand that. But please understand when you look at, let's say, the sales tax in the state of Illinois. So if you go out there in Sharm or go up in the States and you buy something, you're going to see your taxes up 10 to 11%. That includes all the taxes from the taxing bodies. Out of that, 6.25 goes to the state of Illinois. Out of the 6.25, 1% goes back to municipalities. 0.25 goes to the RTA. Go out there, compare a 5% sales tax with any other state around us, and you tell me, is that competitive or not? Many other states, listen guys, not just, this is an observation. I don't want anyone going out there and say, hey, Fred is proposing they rebase these taxes. No, I just want to make sure we, we understand this. Uh, many other states tax services, we know. If you look at our income tax, the 4.95, if you make $50,000, you pay 4.95. If you make a gazillion dollars, you pay 4.95. 32 other states in the state of Illinois have a graduated tax, as well as the federal government. So it's not a bad thing, because many other states do that. But now, you look at the uh, income tax of 4.95, compare that with any other state. You look at Wisconsin, they have a graduated tax. If you make $50,000 or more, you pay more in taxes, income tax, and Wisconsin, they will do it here if you make $50,000. So we need to have a smart conversation. We need to address, and I mentioned this before, property taxes. That, to me, is the biggest problem, but that goes hand in hand with how we fund education. And until we find a way to fund education adequately, we're going to have a problem. Now, I was part of the Governor's Funding Reform Commission, and that commission put out a report that's pretty much acknowledged that we need around $7 billion to adequately fund education. And the administration arbitrarily decided, okay, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to contribute $350 million a year of new money towards education for the next 10 years. If my math is correct, that's $3.5 billion. So in order to get to the $7 billion, it will probably take us to 2037 at the $350 million a year. I can also tell you this. They you think that $350 million a year would be easy to find for education in the last two years, and I can tell you because I'm part of those negotiations, we're having a hard time coming up with $350 million right now. So until we address that, we're not going to be able to address the issue of property taxes. And to me, that, that's, that's the, the biggest thing. I know there's a conversation going on about graduated taxes versus flat tax, and the implication and the notion that if you have graduated tax that everybody's going to pay more, it is absurd. It all depends where you set the rates. It all depends how much you want to generate. If I want to generate $10 billion, heck, yeah, everybody's going to pay a lot more. If I want to generate just $2 billion for now, and somehow have some reforms to find ways to cut costs somewhere else, that's the way to do it. But again, anytime you talk about taxes, it's an easier to react if you want to raise taxes. It's just so hard to have that conversation, especially now when everybody's up for re-election. But well, we need to have a conversation. People need to take a step back and really look at these numbers objectively, look at these in silos, and understand the dynamic and how do we make it work. Representative Musman. 
So I think the state is in uh, the early phases of being able to implement that er internet sales tax uh, you know, that passed through the court system. So I, I don't net have figures on how much money that might possibly bring in, but certainly I think that's um, something optimistic that we are looking toward. Uh, I, Representative Crespo highlighted a number of a number of points. Like most other states, tax services. Um, and in a good tax, in a good tax, it should be low and broadly applied to a wide variety of things. Right now, the state of Illinois largely only taxes goods, so our base is very, very narrow. So as we compare ourselves to other states, that's certainly a contrast. Indiana, Wisconsin, our neighboring states do tax more services, and that was certainly a concept that even Governor Rauner had introduced during his time here. So that's always a conversation that's on the table, although it is a hard one, as, as the representative pointed out, because now it means you're gonna be taxed on something you didn't used to be taxed on when you already feel really overtaxed. So even though you might objectively look at it and say, well, it makes sense as a concept, how does that feel to your wallet? Uh, I would also say, you know, again, I think the progressive tax is the next really big conversation on the table. It actually started a couple of years ago under the Quinn administration, and certainly I, I believe the governor candidates have been talking about it, J.B. Pritzker has been talking about it. Most other states and the federal government use this model, um, and, and even Wisconsin has that model. If we use Wisconsin's collective income and sales tax package, our state would bring in 10 billion more dollars. Is Wisconsin a highly egregious high tax state that millionaires are fleeing from? And could we in some way change our model, as Fred said, to bring in more money, but yet not be so egregious that we've driven out all of our millionaires? I, I certainly think these are reasonable conversations that we can have. We know when it was put on the ballot, 60% of the residents statewide were in support of taxing millionaires just on the amount of money they made over a million dollars to bring in a little bit more revenue. So I do certainly think that, again, we should not be afraid to have a conversation, and especially a conversation that does not make us an outlier among our neighboring states or among other large states that we can compare ourselves to. And I think that's the next big thing. Now, in order for that to happen, it would actually be the public who made that decision. We would vote with a three-fifths majority in the House and the Senate to put it on the ballot during a November election, and the residents of our state would decide should we have a graduated income tax or remain on a flat tax. I do want to make that clear to you. The residents are a huge key player in whether or not this would come to fruition, and therefore, the General Assembly would have to build enough trust among the public that the rates and the tiers that would be that would go into effect would be acceptable to the majority of the residents. Because as you know, they're highly suspicious of the General Assembly and highly suspicious of anything to do with taxes. So if we think that this is going to happen, boy, it really better be an appealing plan and it really better be presented so that they trust that this is what they're going to get for their vote. Thank you. Representative Morrison, the final word on this. Okay. Um, what's my plan for more revenue? We need more taxpayers. Period. We need more individuals, and I want them at, at every income level. I want high earners in the state of Illinois because they spend their money here. They buy things. They buy cars and boats and planes and country club memberships, and they spend at restaurants and bars and they entertain and do all the things. I want it all. I want Illinois to be a destination state once again. You know, the, there's a talk about the Great Migration when when manufacturing was a big component of, of the Illinois economy of the numbers of individuals who came to Illinois because there were so many job opportunities. That's what we want. And there are pockets of, of our region that seem to be doing well. I mean, there's a lot of uh, big companies. They want to be downtown because they're uh, their employee base or there are certain reasons why they want to be downtown, their financial services or whatever. There's places like Elk Grove Village, which obviously is a jewel. It's one of the biggest business parks in the world. It's right by O'Hare, one of the busiest airports in the world too. And you have manufacturing firms that are farther out, like Caterpillar, that are shutting down their operations or they're moving their operations to other states where they can operate more profitably because it's a global marketplace. And so that's what Illinois has to do is just be more attractive. And I want small businesses, I want medium businesses, I want big businesses. And notice what Foxconn did. They wanted to be close to Chicago, close to O'Hare, but with a Wisconsin address. And so um, we have to recognize that we have so many advantages, but we've got to get our policies right and be friendlier to all taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have time for some questions? Patricia, you want to cut it? Well, I had to go. Yeah. You, yeah. I know you had to leave right away, so is yeah. 
Um, if you'd like to follow up with me later, uh, you can find my information, my phone number, my email on the tables. And I'm sorry, I do have to go. I have a 1.30 meeting in my office. So thank, thank you again for having me. legislature doing to solve issues from not having a budget and how long will Illinois taxpayers be paying for that? So I, I would say kind of in a kind of get in a quick snapshot, right? At, at the highest point of the emergency of not having a state budget, we were sixteen billion dollars in debt. Um, so we did we did get an agreement to go out and borrow a lot of money, about six billion dollars at a much lower interest rate, and we rapidly paid down our highest interest rate bills first. So right now our debt is probably at about eight billion dollars, maybe just under that. So it, so again, I think there are questions about based on the amount of revenue we have coming in and what we do to address that situation. How much are we able to devote to continuing to pay down the debt? And certainly we want to be very cautious about which bills we're choosing to pay down. Medicaid bills are definitely the priority because they bring matching money back in from the federal government that we can then churn right back into paying down those bills. But I, I think it will take us a, a couple of years, again, based on any number of factors that change how much money we can direct to the debt. Senator Murphy. Thank Unfortunately, it's going to take us a while to dig out of this. It was terrible, 736 days without a budget. And we incurred an additional billion dollars in debt from not paying our bills on time. That has huge consequences. And, you know, in any state, the economic growth that Illinois has seen, um, depending on who you talk to, if the Tribune or Cranes, uh, anywhere from 4.7 to 5.6% growth. Um, so there is growth happening in Illinois. But when you have policies that in a refusal to negotiate a budget, then it, it's costly. It's very, very costly. And it was self-imposed. It never had to happen. That's what makes it even more criminal. But we are going forward. Uh, like I said at the beginning, uh, bills that say um, we shouldn't pay 12% interest. Uh, we have to have it reflective of CPI rational numbers like that. So those are things too that we're putting in place to prevent um, it incurring those additional expenses. I think my colleagues pretty much said it all. Let me just go back to uh, what Representative Musman mentioned that prior to this administration taking office, our liabilities were sitting around six billion dollars. Six million dollars is really around three to four billion dollars in what we call the thirty-day bucket. Those are those are your your, your new receivables. So, so that that's okay. So it wasn't that bad. The lack of a budget, we saw what happened. It, we went up to like 16, 17 billion dollars. Uh, and thanks to the curves of some Republicans that after two or three years decided, you know, enough is enough. We need to do something about this. And they did. And, and, and it's unfortunate that, that uh, Tom Morrison left because I want to talk a bit about the honest budget or dishonest budget. We passed the budget. And the question is, are we better off with a no budget or some kind of budget? And I think we discovered after two years of not having a budget, really, really created a lot of havoc throughout the entire state. We had a lot of non for profits that had to shut down. Uh, we had other stations like Waves that probably struggled a little bit because the money was not coming in. Although, Rebecca Dar does a great job in, in going out there and looking at others to help her. Uh, but we had others. And, and, you know, the Echo Center and Elgin, they had a hard time because they were not getting paid. And it also comes down to priorities. So if you do have money, we're going to spend the money. So the governor created this group called Do It, the Department of Innovation and Technology. I come from, from, from the private sector. I understand how important it is to have a good IT system in place. The IT system that the, that the state currently has dates back to like 1898. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's no doubt. Can you want that we do need to update the system at the tune of a billion dollars? Well, the question is, okay, well, Governor, I agree with you, but how are you going to pay for it? Oh, easy. We'll take money from human services, we'll take money from corrections, we'll take money from other areas. So that's not the way to do it. If you want something, we need to figure out a way to pay for it. And do it, you know, I've been fighting to do it. Actually, they've been asking for a billion dollars, and I'm funding them at $300 million. Because not only that, they're not very transparent. I can't even see the work that they do. The need is there, and it's a matter of priorities. I think Joel Biden said it once, uh, don't tell me what your values are, 
So over your budget, and I'll tell you what your values are. Uh, but but it's, it's, you know, we need to do it. Uh, it's caused a lot of problems, and, and again, I don't care how you vote. And I was happy to see that Governor Rauner finally, after four years, admitted, shoot, you know what? I probably did things wrong. I could have done things better. Unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of institutions got rid of me. It's going to take us a while to get out of this, but we can do it. We just have to work together. Okay, we have another one. Representative Crespo, thank you for shining the light on the MCO mismanagement. Is there any way to make HFS accountable to us in the way social service agencies are accountable to them? So, HFS, uh, Felisa Norwood was the uh, director for HFS, and she's the architect of the MCO, uh, MCO in the state of Illinois, and she resigned. Uh, Part of the MCO problems, aside from the fact that I mentioned that the audit revealed a lot of problems, is that they pay, the MCOs are for private institutions, they're insurance companies. And the state of Illinois, under MCOs, pay the taxes that these private companies are supposed to pay. Keep that in mind. And the tune of almost $200 million a year. We discovered that the MCOs are required, since they're private companies, to pay a tax, and the state is picking that up. And since so it's considered revenue, they have to pay a tax on top of that. And guess what? The state picks that up too. We never did that under fee for service. Now, when I asked the director, Director Norwood, the committee, do the feds require that we pay that tax? Do the feds require that we pay that tax? She looks me straight in the eyes and said, absolutely. Well, we just had them come before the Audit Commission a couple of weeks ago, and she's not there anymore, but I asked the new folks, is it true that the feds require that we pay for this? They're like, no, they're not. It's not required. It's an allowable expense, but we don't have to do it. Again, it's a huge problem, and this is just the first phase of the MCO project model, $7.2 billion, that they still can't account how much they pay in administrative fees, the program today is worth over $60 billion. And there's, and there's no bid, by the way. Somehow they were able to circumvent the procurement process and give out a $60, well, $68 billion project out there with no bids. And unfortunately, since these are for private institutions and there's uh, Medicaid payments, uh, they're circumventing the appropriation process too, so we've lost control over that as well. It's a huge problem. We're not talking. I mean, I'm glad that the press did pick up on the audit. We haven't talked more about this, but I think, uh, like I said before, we did send a letter to the attorney general asking her to asking the office to investigate. And I hope that soon we find out exactly what's going on. Well, I want to thank our legislators for coming, Representative Morrison, <laughs> Westman, Senator Murphy, and Senator Crespo. Thank you all for coming. We'll do this again next year. And Jennifer Walker wants me to exit left, I believe. Uh, I'd like to just, first of all, thank you all for your discussion. I think we've had a really insightful session today. I encourage you to use your representatives as resources and their district staff. Um, they're well, very well informed about what's going on in your communities and surrounding communities as well as what's going on in the state. Um, so thank you again for sharing your knowledge with us today. It's an important part of the process. And I'd like to introduce Lynn Wilkes with Alexian Brothers um, Hospital and again thank them for their hospitality today.